Let us pray. Living God, help us. Help us so to hear your holy word that we may truly understand, that understanding we may believe, and believing we may follow in all faithfulness and obedience, seeking your honor and glory in all that we do. Through Christ our Lord, amen. Our scripture reading is from Mark chapter 2, the first 12 verses. For the gospel of Mark, that's a long reading and a long telling of a story. But if we hear carefully, we will hear two stories. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing to him a paralyzed man, carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now, some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's a blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts, and he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say? To say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat, and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone. And they praised God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. This is the word of the Lord. So how shall we retell this story, that we can hear it again as if for the first time? Perhaps for some of you, this is the first time. Good for you. For some of you, it's the first time in a long time. For some, it's the hundredth telling of the story. But we want to hear it again, and Mark wants every retelling of every story to always sound like news. Fast-breaking just happened. You're one of the first to hear it. It's news. It's good news. It's good news for disciples. Well, we have a decision to make. Which story are we going to retell? The story of the sick man who is paralyzed and then is healed and walks out. Or the sinning man who is guilty is forgiven and walks away with his burden lifted. Which do you prefer? Do you like that tangible, visible story? Paralysis, you know it when you see it. This man couldn't walk. Many people already knew that. Frankly, it's a lot of men that are bringing him into the home, four of whom are carrying him. You have no doubts about what happened. He couldn't walk, and now he can. It's a very practical story. You like those kind, and because it's practical, it's real. Or do you like the spiritual and invisible story, if you will, of guilt that you may or may not be able to see, probably not, and the man's freedom, new freedom from it? It requires faith to see this one more clearly, but it's permanent. His sins are forgiven, and therefore it's real. Well, you know I'm going to tell both stories. They come together. Mark wants us to hear them together. It's about a man who's sick and sick of sin, a man whose sin has made him sick. These things are intertwined, interwound. One person, one life, one body and soul. These are different things. Gout is not gluttony, but they're related. They're found together. You and I are neither souls with bodies or bodies with souls. We are human beings, body and soul. One person created by one God having one Redeemer. 
Listen to how the Bible so very often puts them together, sometimes making them distinct, and these two belong together, sometimes indistinctly. You don't even know which one of the two they're talking about. It's almost interchangeable. At the dedication of Solomon's temple, God himself announces what is high and holy about this place and therefore what will happen here. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and I will heal their land. When the psalmist wants us to recount the great benefits of God, He says, praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us, and he satisfies our desires with good things so that our youth is renewed like an eagle's. Forgiveness and healing. And then he says it straightforwardly. He forgives all our sins. He heals all our diseases. Isaiah, when he wants to recount God's great faithfulness in times past, says, you restored me to health and let me live. You have put all my sins behind your back. When he wants to recount God's goodness to us in times yet to come, he puts on the words, the word of the Lord speaks to him saying, I was enraged by his sinful greed. I punished him, but I will heal him. When the psalmist wants to talk about his own soul, Lord, have mercy on me, heal me, for I have sinned against you. When God pleads with his people, he says, return, faithless people, and I will heal you of backsliding. And Hosea, when he wants to announce the promised salvation of God, says, I will heal their waywardness. Sin and sickness together. Sickness and sin sickness together. Together they are tokens of death at work within us, and around us. And it is not God's intention that we should live under the life-crushing weight of death. Forgiveness and healing both are gracious movements of God into the sphere of our withering and decaying world and lives. Forgiveness and healing both lift that burden here and now. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. He forgives all our sins. He heals all our diseases. This is good news for disciples. The poor and the poor in spirit, the hungry and the hungry at heart, the lost, the least, the lonely, the languishing, those who are sinning, those who are sick, and those who don't care anymore about the difference between the two because it simply hurts so much. And who will come and save me? Well, Maybe, just maybe, that's the sermon. I was worried about an amen right there. (laughs) No, no, too late now. But let's be clear about a couple of things. First and always, Jesus. All these Old Testament passages on forgiveness and healing, on sin and sickness, God and only God forgives and heals. God who made our bodies heals them, restoring them. God who made our souls forgives them, restoring them. It can only be God who does this. Only he was there at the beginning to restore us as we were always intended to be. In this intertwined and twinned story in Mark of forgiveness and healing, Jesus heals and Jesus forgives. Jesus does this. The importance of that must law must not and cannot be missed. The crowd will be amazed at it. A few will be offended by it. But no one will miss it. Jesus Prophet, priests, and kings did not and do not do this. Angels don't even come close. And there's no passage in the Old Testament that even suggests that the Messiah will be doing this. This is reserved for God alone, the maker of all things visible, our body, and the maker of all things invisible, our souls. God creates, so only God can recreate, remake, renew, 
restore, revive, heal, and forgive. Second, let's be clear about Jesus' disciples. Mm, That would be you and me. Mark's gospel is a disciple training manual. This is what Jesus did. This is what we should do. This is what the first disciple saw and heard and experienced. This is what we disciples now witness when we read the gospel of Mark. This is what the Lord showed them there and then. This is what the Lord shows us here and now. While no one is authorized to forgive and heal in the Old Testament, many were authorized to announce it, to proclaim forgiveness and healing of God, prophet, priests, and kings. It is the exclusive work of God to forgive and heal, but it is the glorious privilege of the people of God to announce that forgiveness and healing. It has also become the awesome mission of the disciples of Jesus to participate in the ministry. All of this, all of even this, is still prefixed by come follow me. It is the inclusive mission of God to invite us to follow Jesus, continuing, extending, and advancing his ministry through the ages and around the world. And that includes the practice of forgiveness and healing. It exclusively comes from God and now is given to us to announce and to practice. So, let's forgive Let's heal. This Friday night, the San Diego Rescue Mission had again a graduation here in our sanctuary, three times each year. Over 500 people were gathered. It was full, and most of them weren't Presbyterian, so it was loud, too. For all the graduates, a long year of toil and trouble and trial and prayer and claiming God's promises in a public graduation in which the praise of God was spoken. But when they describe their lives, they universally describe that life as broken. That's their witness. Sin and sickness, all wrapped up together. Maybe you can't even sort it all out anymore. But certainly you can't be that sick and that addicted without causing harm to self and harm to others around you. That's sin. And you can't be that far from God's will and not grow sick. Forgiveness and healing. Healing and forgiveness. We're all in a rescue mission. Analysis is sometimes necessary, yes, to sort it all out, to know the truth fully, to understand the extent and the nature of our brokenness so that we can attend to it directly. But it is hard Sometimes impossible. Our lives are too long, our troubles too many, our hearts too complicated, sickness too involved, sin too deceitful. The forgiveness and healing we are to offer is to be both of these things together. Your sins are forgiven. Get up, take your mat, and go home. Which, I ask you, disciple of Jesus, which is easier to say? Announce and practice this forgiveness. Announce and practice this healing, for it is the healing and forgiveness of Jesus. Well, the sermon could end there as well. Could. But here's one more thought. Verse 10 is a sentence impossible to translate. The grammar simply doesn't work. This is an interrupted story in Mark's gospel. Five stories of healing. This is the last, that of the paralyzed man. Followed by five stories of conflict and controversy, of which this is the first. The last of the first set of five and the first of the second set of five are intertwined into one story. It's it's done with quite a bit of genius, I think. It's an interrupted story. It starts with the healing of the paralyzed man, 
becomes a story of the forgiveness of sins and the controversy and conflict that begets and then returns to a story of the healing of the man. And in the midst of that interrupted story is an interrupted sentence right in the middle of it. Jesus is talking to the crowds and to his detractors. Jesus says that you may know that the Son of Man, the first time he makes self-reference in Mark's gospel, that you may know that the Son of Man has the authority to forgive sins on earth The sentence trails off. There's no finish to it. He turns in the midst to the paralyzed man and says, I tell you, the second reference to himself, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. It might have struck some at the beginning as irrelevant. It certainly struck some as irreverent. It might strike some as just unnecessary. The man was sick. Take care of the visible, please. Or for others of us who have learned and practiced the faith for a long time, we know that the permanent is important. Let's just stick with the forgiveness of sins and let's not mess with this other stuff. But no, we will do both. Jesus will say, your sins are forgiven. You can get up now. Take your mat and go home. The visible, tangible witness of physical healing is the demonstration of the authority of Jesus to forgive sins. The church heals that the world may know and believe that God forgives. Again, Isaiah. It is the Lord who will save us. No one living in Zion will say, I am ill. And the sins of those who dwell there will be forgiven. Well, hopefully, that's a sermon. That's all I got. It's the simplicity on the far side of complexity. That's what Mark will always do. Yeah, there's this and there's that and there's interruptions and grammar that doesn't work and drive you crazy in your Greek 101 course. But at the end of it, it's simple and straightforward. Jesus forgives and heals. That's the sermon. So, will you preach it? Will you practice it? Let us pray. Lying on our mat, we heard you say, your sins are forgiven. You can get up. Now standing, give us the faith and the courage, and every grace we need to announce that forgiveness, to proclaim that healing, and to practice both. In the name of Jesus, amen.